Sidewalk Labs is this amazing opportunity to bring a bunch of technologists together with a bunch of urbanists to take advantage of the amazing things that technology has to offer with a deep understanding about what really makes cities tick. Instead of saying a problem is just about technology or it's just about policy, in most cases the answer is it's both. We find the very best people in the world who can go and think about solving those types of problems. Tonight's event focuses on the question, what can technology do to help cities improve housing affordability? Good evening, I'm Dr. Andrea Chagou, Director of the Real Estate Innovation Lab um, at the School of Architecture and Planning um, Center for Real Estate's uh, MIT uh, home base. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about affordable housing, but in general, um, the lab has a resource plat platform that identifies the frontier of the built environment. It identifies anything that is new and uh, changing and disrupting um, the real estate and development property markets. And we identify new innovations in product process and technologies and then link that back uh, to economic and financial outcomes in the marketplace. And the reason why we do this is because we want to uh, help institutional investors, larger scale companies, understand the changes that are coming down the road, as well as the smaller scale companies that are in the competitive landscape to help them understand what's coming down the pipeline. Today, I want to talk to you about the value of innovation um, in affordable housing. So this is research that I conducted with Rohir Holtemans um, and Pete Eichholz. And the objective of this research was really to identify um, whether or not, if you innovated in the built environment, if this actually had a incremental change to the financial and economic um, outcomes uh, within the social affordable public housing sector. So whether or not these changes actually diffuse um, to that area. And we have a very unique study um, that enabled us uh, to identify those characteristics and whether or not there is indeed um, incremental value to changing and making the built environment better in the affordable housing sector. So affordable public housing, um, if you take an international perspective, um, the OECD uh, countries sees housing as a right. It's, it's really a public mandate um, where we have a purely public offering that can vary in how it actually comes to the marketplace. Um, we have uh, subsidized housing, we have public-private partnerships in terms of housing, and we even have examples of purely private enterprises offered, offering houses um, in the affordable and social housing sector. Um, in, in addition, and what's really important in terms of the variation, is that the size of this affordable housing stock really varies um, across the globe. And the United States happens to be one of the lower housing stocks in the world in terms of actually providing affordable housing. So about 1.3 million units um, as a percentage, according to uh, the Housing and Urban Development um, Agency, actually enables us to have about 1% of the stock um, that's actually affordable housing. Um, the Netherlands actually comes in with about 2.4 million units or 35% of the stock, or France comes in at about 5 million units or 20% of the stock. This significant variation in this different approaches to understanding, just as an example, um, to providing affordable housing across the world means that we can use the greater world as a laboratory um, to understand how we can deliver better affordable housing in better circumstances um, and maybe even explore and uh, expand the stock for the greater community. Now, the EU overall wants to enable a systemic framework um, that, it, that opens up innovation. Um, and it actually invests heavily and regulates heavily towards that direction. Um, and in particular, they're really doing this um, on energy efficiency and sustainability metrics for the built environment. So energy efficiency or energy performance of buildings um, has been in terms of regulation been implemented in 2003, 2010, and 2012 um, at large scale across the entire EU. Um, but a part of that is actually learning and teaching um, individual developers and universities and companies how to actually 
create design and systems interventions that enable the buildings to actually physically change. Um, so to do this, um, they actually created the EU 7th framework and the Horizon 2020 programs. Um, and the Horizon 2020 program is probably one of the largest stimulus packages in history to ever go towards energy efficiency and sustainability in the built environment. About 80 billion um, euros has gone into this and will continue to go into this um, until 2020. So buildings are a large source of carbon emissions. Europe's buildings emit about 36% of CO2 emissions. Those numbers are constant for the United States and a little bit higher in China. Um, housing emits about 630 billion kilograms of CO2 um, as of 2010. Those numbers are a little higher in the United States and a little higher in China. Um, the real estate sector is a huge polluter. 30% um, of raw materials are used, 55% of wood. 30% of waste output comes from the built environment um, and 12% of potable water. So the buildings in themselves are just really wasteful and using lots of resources. So we could use some design and system interventions to really infiltrate and actually really change the built environment to be more efficient. Um, in addition, and if that doesn't convince you, the bottom line is really being impacted. So 20% of energy use in the EU is from the residential sector. The 2010 energy bill for those company, for those buildings was 225 billion. That's a lot of money that we could start to increasingly deduct the price tag off of. Um, not to mention electricity and gas prices are increasing year over year. So by about 3.9 and 7.4% per year, um, which is about 10% of total housing costs on average across the EU. That's higher in um, the Scandinavian countries, a little bit lower in say Greece and Italy. So we can make these improvements through innovation, and but there's a series of challenges and opportunities to do this. So Dutch households face an increasing energy prices, so three to five percent per year. Any 80 percent of the homes that are actually on the ground right now are actually going to have to stay in place um, because we're not going to re rebuild them. Um, so we're going to have to figure out ways to actually redevelop them or reposition them. Um, so we have to focus on greening the existing building stock and that can be a little bit more um, intellectually challenging for designers and architects and engineers um, to come up with interventions that actually make sense across large swaths of cohorts, say from the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, but tying this investment to maintenance and renovation, we see that actually there's this incremental value and that's what I'm going to dig into um, next. So, if we look at where green buildings are in the overall spectrum of uh, innovative products, we see that um, there is a series of lots of unknown um, innovations that are coming before us. So uh, robotic self-assemblage, um, these types of buildings, we, we, we don't even have them on the ground yet, but they're starting to be um, increasingly known and increasingly a part of the, the built environment stock. So smart homes, super tall needles, we're in Manhattan, this is a part of the, the urban fabric now. Smart connected and green buildings. So these are buildings that we're really thinking of. The building that we're in is very energy efficient and sustainable and is LEED, um, LEED certified. So the green buildings are now becoming a, a really accepted part um, of our categorical understanding of how we change buildings. Um, and when we really want to change something, when we really want to innovate, innovation comes from design. So, and it comes from several dimensions. So there's really this internal stuff that really makes um, the building actually livable, workable, and play, playful for all of us. Um, but it's really these shell, the shell of the building, the space plan, the services, the skin, and the structure um, that come from the architects and the engineers that enable us to have a better, more innovative structure, more inefficient, and more cost-effective. Um, an adoption of these types of innovation really comes in stages. Um, and we're always constantly trying to move from R&D, invention, innovation, and quickly to diffusion, especially when it comes to energy efficiency and sustainability. So we move very quickly um, through these stages so we can scale and uptake and refine and get these benefits from these types of innovations. So this becomes particularly important when we want to do this in the affordable housing sector, where we have a public good, a public right, and we really want to make sure that everybody's uh, housing right is actually at the same standard. 
What we know is that um, across the world, um, energy performance, um, sustainability actually commands premiums, both in the residential and the commercial uh, real estate sectors. So transactions and rents are on average 13% um, higher. Um, effective rents are 7% higher. Um, so that means that buildings are actually capitalizing on these interventions and innovations that architects and engineers are actually putting in place. Um, and this is enabling greater value, but also more cost effectiveness for the built environment. So to really look at what we can do to understand this for the affordable housing sector, um, we put together a lot of data resources um, in the Netherlands um, to look at about uh, 30,000 trades. Um, some of which have undergone the process of sustainability um, and energy efficiency retrofits and redevelopment to really think about those design and engineering interventions and a big chunk of them have not and what we do is we really match them like for like with the exception of the fact that they've undergone some sort of green intervention or sustainability intervention um, and what we do to do that is we, we identify um, labels or energy performance certificates labels A to G, and then we look on the back end and we un try to understand what exactly happened um, in those design interventions of those A, B, and C buildings that underwent that redevelopment process. And we see that there is varying characteristics that change, and these labeled A and B buildings are really out of the park. Here's an example of labels that are actually put on the buildings. So what we actually find is that green buildings have a very high premium in terms of their performance. So um, anything that is labeled A++, A+, A, and B has a very high premium relative to those that do not have um, a high labeling characteristic. So we see, recognize, and see premiums um, of about 6 uh, to 12 percent um, for those buildings that actually have undergone systemic design and engineering interventions. And what we see is that if you have an energy label of A or B, you get about a 2.6% premium in the actual affordable housing resale stock. But energy labels of A, you see about a 7% uh, a 7 um, premium overall. So what is the lesson for all of this? So if affordable housing is a right, it's a public good, it is something that is enabled by society, and most of the buildings are actually there. It means that we can also make them better. And that is actually valuable. It is valued in society. It's valued by those within the income cohorts that actually can enable and buy affordable housing. Um, but it also means that we can actually do it from a socially sustainable way. Developers and governments can actually come together to finance these types of interventions and make the affordable housing stock better, equitable, um, and importantly, valuable.